name's Sarah. I'm a diagnostic radiographer, and Gail, my colleague, is somewhere in here. So, most of you probably don't really know that we exist. Oh, she says going back. There we go. So, this is us. We're based in the middle of a field in Oxfordshire. Um, you might know us by our old name, which was the Health Protection Agency, or we still get called the NRPB as well. We answer to most names. So this is the clinical team. There is one person missing, which is Nazreen. So we've got Helen on the left. She's a therapy radiographer. Obviously, that's me. There's my colleague, Gail. Louise works just down the corridor from us. She's another nuclear medicine person. She's in a slightly different group, but we can still call on nuclear medicine expertise if we need it. And Una is another radio, um, radiotherapy radiographer. So we've got all of the modalities covered in our building. So what do we do? Oh, she says, there we go. We don't do PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> so we're basically an independent resource. We're here to give advice to anyone who asks for it. Um, so we get emails from members of the public going, oh my goodness, I've just been to dentist, had an x-ray, and I've just found out I'm pregnant. What do I do? <coughs> And um, that's quite a common one. We get phone calls from CQC, we get phone calls from Maria saying we've had this query, what do you reckon? So we, we take questions from anyone really. So at the end of the presentation are our email addresses. So if you've got any queries, you can drop them to us. If you all will email us on your way home tonight, it may take a while to get back to you, but we will try and get back to you when we can, or we'll farm you off to somebody else who's better placed. Maybe Maria. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. We're here for advice on compliance with IRMA and best practice with radiography, that kind of thing. So we work slightly differently, the diagnostic and the therapy team. So the therapy team um, <coughs> do, they do clinical site visits. The diagnostic team, we actually go out on inspections with the devolved administrators in the devolved administration. So we work with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and we go out on inspections. So basically, we're there to kind of translate between the clinical staff and the inspectors because they don't necessarily have a radiographic background. So unlike CQC, where you've got radiographers and clinical scientists, in the devolved administrations, one is, I think, a structural engineer. We've got two nurses, we've got one dentist, and I think we've got a mental health nurse. So that's the background from the inspections in the other countries. So we're there to kind of provide the clinical, technical side of things. So that's what we do. Does mean though that we're there and we know all of the tricks of the trade, because um, we've probably used most of them in our, in our time. We also still practice. So I was out on a clinical placement last week, because I can't provide advice on what best practice is if I don't know what current practice is. So that's a little bit about me and what we do and the team. Let's see if I press the right button this time. No? <laughs> I'm gonna keep my finger on this one now. So what we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at um, examples of what could be included in a number of good procedures rather than average or scrape you through procedures. Uh, we're going to look at some other documents that should be in place and we're going to look at learning from incidents and new misses. Um, some of this I'm going to skip over because we've already covered it and we need to catch up on some time. So, we've all been going on about this, patient ID. It's definitely a big issue. We get loads of long patients uh, get an x-ray. So, an average employer's procedure will say, we do a three-point check on all patients before we press the button. So, but obviously, that's clearly not enough because we're getting loads of incidents. And you've still seen this as well. It's about 36% of incidents are to do with the wrong patient, either to do with referrer error or operator error in that we didn't bother checking. So, a good procedure will also include <coughs> how to overcome language barriers, and by that I mean hearing issues, uh, unconscious patients, uh, paediatric patients, those kind of things. It will also include how to ID, ID patients in theatre. So these are all the contingency plans. So on top of your three-point check, what do you do when you can't do your three-point check? What's your name? What's your address? What's your date of birth? So these should all be written down, okay? There's no use just having them vaguely there in the air. They need to be included in your procedure. And again, what to do if the information that the patient gives you doesn't match. And this is the place where you would include your pause and check. And again, it's clearly something that's becoming more popular. We've all been honking on that today. And again, how do you access translation services? I bet these posters are all around your hospital. 
but these could also be included in your employer's procedure. If you do include them in your procedure, I would add them as an appendix, because trusts do tend to change providers of translation services on a fairly regular basis. If you have it as an appendix, you can change it whenever you want. Don't include it in the body of the text, otherwise you have to go through the whole review process, which gets a bit complicated. But making sure your staff know how to access these, it's all very well being able to access them 9 to 5, but do your staff know how to, what to do in an emergency? So at 2 in the morning, you've got a patient that doesn't speak English, how on earth are you going to cope with this? So have these easily available to staff. Now, I nicked this from, I didn't nick it, I got permission to take it up. <laughs> I do have a habit of collecting paper when I go out and about. This is just an example that one site um, has adopted to help with the whole translation process. So rather than having to ring the big word or whatever, they did some research to look at the languages that were commonly spoken in their catchment area. And so they've got cards, they're laminated, <coughs> they're at reception, they're in every examination room, they're all over the place with the standard questions that you would ask for your three-point check. So you've got, what's your name? What's your address? What's your date of birth? Is this all spelt right on the form? Clearly, they are not going to help you have a nice little chat with your patient about the holiday and all of that, but they will help you with the basics. So, you can also have them for pregnancy, pregnancy inquiries, because obviously if you need translation for a check-in ID, you're going to need it for pregnancy as well. <coughs> obviously, you just need some different questions. And again, this is just another example. And these have actually included the pause and check questions as well, so you can check which leg is it. So they're not perfect, but they are good examples to have around, but they do need to be available to staff. So I'll just go over this again because it is important. So pause and check. It can increase the detection of incorrect referrals. This is the referrer, so they kick click the wrong drop down or they put the wrong sticker on the form. If you chat to your patient and say, why are you here? What's the problem? Hopefully that will weed out some of the wrong patient referrals because you will not have the clinical information. It may not match. It might do. You might just be unlucky, but it will weed out some of them. It can reduce the number of reportable incidents. Now that has to be a good thing. If you don't have to contact your, your inspector on a, such a frequent basis, that has to be a good thing. The chief executive will certainly think the same. And it provides time for your staff to go through the mental checklist. So, what am I doing? You do need to actually listen to what the patient tells you, though, rather than carry on thinking, right, I'm going to do this. So, listen to their responses when they give you the information. Diagnostic reference levels. You do have to have a procedure for diagnostic reference levels. And, handily, the regulations give you the magic words that you really need to include in there. Specifying that these are not expected to be exceeded for standard procedures when good and normal practice regarding diagnostic and technical performance is applied. Make sure when you go back to your departments that those magic words are in your procedure. I think this is the only example in Irma where it actually gives you the words to use. Always a good starting point. So, you don't just have to have a procedure, you have to have your DRLs, and we've already gone over these. But it says having regard for European diagnostic reference levels. You can have regard for them, you don't need to have them, as we've said. Um, let's skip that one. These are your national ones. So these are the national DRLs for um, general radiography. I've already said they're a bit old. They don't necessarily reflect um, changes in equipment we've had recently. Certainly, if you manage to get an entrance skin dose of four on your dental equipment, something's gone quite badly wrong. So these may not be ideal for your practice, but they're available if you wanted them. And I think Nick mentioned these. These are the national reference doses. So these are from national dose surveys that we have done at now Public Health England. This was published on the HPA banner before we changed. And again, these are some common sort of doses that you could adopt if you wanted to as your DRLs. So you can download this, it's available on the website, um, you can get hold of it, it's on, on the PHE pages of .gov.uk. So these are the general ones, there are also ones for CT and some fluoro and paediatric patients. <coughs> so, we've touched on this again, they need to be reviewed when they are consistently exceeded. So if they're not for every patient, 
dear Rose, you can't go. It's patient. It's, there's a signpost. There's the things that set off your spider sense tingling. Something isn't right. Okay? So that's when you need to start looking into it. If you've exceeded it for a massive rugby player, that's fine. DRLs are set at the 75th percentile. You're going to go over it in some cases. All right? 25% of your patients are likely to be over it. It's when you've got the little old granny that you've exceeded it for. That's when things should start being a bit worried. So a good procedure could include the fact that you've got local DRLs. They reflect your patients, they reflect your equipment and your practice. They're much better than the national ones. It's a sign that there's good radiation protection culture in your department. Your procedure should also include how often are they reviewed. Are they reviewed as part of the dose surveys? Um, and where are they displayed? We've already touched on this. They need to be used by staff. So you need to have them where staff are. So you can have the CT ones in the CT control panel. Um, in, yeah. And you have the general ones in the general room. You don't need to have every DRL in every room. So just have the appropriate ones, the ones that staff are going to use in that room. Otherwise they won't look at them because they'll be just a big old pile of paper. And your procedure should also include what staff should do if they notice that they're being regularly exceeded. So who do they go and speak to? Do they take the room out of use until someone's checked it out? What is it that they do? So that should all be documented so that staff can follow a standard procedure so that everyone is doing the same thing. Research. How many people do research here? Yeah, quite a few. This is another one. You have to have a procedure for research. It needs to include information about dose constraints when there's no benefit expected to the individual. So these would be things like healthy volunteers. So you've got the healthy, in inverted commas, people so they can compare to patients. So don't do many of those, I would imagine. Target doses um, <coughs> for patients which are expected to receive diagnostic or therapeutic. That is probably the most likely set of things that you'll need in your procedure. Most of our patients in the hospital are, are going to have target doses. Um, you need to have special attention for justification and that special attention for those where there's no expected benefit. Uh, it needs to state that they should be volunteers. You can't force anyone to be part of a research program, they must all be volunteers. And they must also have been informed of the risks before the, they have the exposure. Good department will also have information in the procedure about how, how staff can identify research exposures. Obviously, I've already said that they need, they've got dose um, constraints or target doses. If staff don't know that it's a research exposure, how are they going to know whether there's any target doses that are applying here? So, your procedure should include whether people have like a research code on the referral. How is it that your um, referrers flag up that that's a research exposure because you do need to know? I know not everyone does this, but it's something to think about. Specific protocols. You sh each research project should have a specific protocol so that staff know which views to do in which circumstances. So, for example, if you are doing a research study that involves an x-ray of the hand, which series of views are you doing? Are you doing the rheumatology ones? <coughs> Are you doing the views that you would do for trauma? What is it that you would do? Because staff might do different sets of images depending on what their particular mood is like. So you should have a, a protocol for each research project. And you need to have mechanisms in place for informing staff when a research project is finished. Um, we do hear of examples where patients have come for x-rays and the study actually turns out to have stopped recruiting patients, so they've had those x-rays for no reason whatsoever. So, and it's good learning as well. It gets staff interested in the research project if they're getting some kind of feedback as well, rather than just being told to go and do, do these x-rays. We've already touched on this. You must have an equipment inventory, and these are the fields it must have. When you go back to your departments, check your asset register if that's what you're using, because it doesn't always have all of these fields quite often doesn't have the year of manufacture, that's the one that usually slips through the net. And also don't assume that the year of manufacture and the year of installation are the same. Um, it's not unheard of for equipment to sit in warehouses for many moons and then suddenly get put into your room. You might think it's all nice and shiny, may not be. If you're looking for the information, it's usually on those little silver plaques that are in ridiculously hard to get to areas. 
worth checking. So we've already touched medical physicists. They are nice people, they do normally live in basements. I used to work at St Thomas's and if I ever had to go and find physics I'd always take my ID badge so they could identify the body when I got lost in the basement. But, um, but they are, they're mostly good people. <laughs> I work with quite a lot. So, things that they can be involved in, things that are examples of good practice. So, regular dose audits. Um, I could be about to be run out of the room from suggesting doing regular ones, but it's a good idea. Um, they could help you get your DRLs in place. Nick's already said that it's radiography data and you should be involved as well. It don't make them do it. It's team effort. Use of local equipment settings rather than manufacturer preset ones is key. Manufacturer ones will always give you a much higher doses because they want your pictures to look beautiful. We're happy with adequate if it answers the clinical question. So, mistakes happen. Don't know about you, but we all have a standard pattern that we fall into when we're x-raying patients. Hi, my name's Sarah, I'm going to be taking your x-ray. I was on a clinical placement last week, I fell straight back into it as if I'd been there the day before. So, it's key though, that when we do this pattern, there's nothing wrong with the standard pattern. It helps you just to sort of treat everyone the same. But you must, make, you must make sure that standards don't slip just because you're doing everything that's routine. So, we will make mistakes. I know I've made some classics in my time. I'm sure everyone else has. But the crucial thing is that we learn from them. And by learning, I don't mean, oops, mental note, won't do that again. I mean telling somebody sharing it because chances are if you've made the mistake other people are in exactly the same boat and they probably have either almost made it or they've also hushed it up so we do need to learn from these things this could be via audit of incidents and near misses to highlight any recurrent issues discussions of incidents and near misses during regular staff meetings who has this as a standard agenda item Sorry. but Obviously, I bet everyone is investigating the misses and telling, but you must share the learning. So there's no point just keeping it, oh, well, we've learnt this. Tell everybody. Everyone can learn from these things. You could have uh, information to send to referrers to remind them of their responsibilities. We've already talked about this. So the regular contact with your referrers, telling them these are our refer referral criteria, and you can <coughs> to provide us with decent clinical information. Chest x ray, please, really isn't going to bite, isn't really going to suitable. So, as I say, learning from incidents and near misses should be shared with all relevant staff, not just the ones that were directly involved in that particular incident. You need to tell the team. All right? Obviously, you can anonymise it. Don't need to name and shame people. That's not what we're after. We're here to try and avoid these things happening again. So again, feedback from incidents. Keep it as a standard agenda item. You haven't had any of that month, brilliant, you can skip over it. But keep it there as a reminder to keep it fresh in people's minds. Um, again, share, share and learn in departmental audit meetings. I don't know if everyone has those, might not, might not have the time. <laughs> so, and newsletters to specific groups of people. Um, items on the internet homepage, if you go on there quite regularly to check your emails. Clearly don't have it there all the time because people just won't look at it, they'll get used to it being there. But if a big, pop, big sign pops up every now and then, it's a good way of sharing information with referrers because they won't read their emails. This is just an example again that I borrowed from a site that I visited. This was, they send a quarterly newsletter out to all of their GPs, um, reminding them about the importance of getting referrals right. Clearly this also includes uh, lab tests, but they have the same problems as, as us. And it's just to keep it fresh in their minds about the importance of making sure they do get the right patient, they do send them the right guest. So this is, I'm going to mention this. You've probably all got these on your table, hopefully. So, these are some audit tools, because that's another requirement that we haven't touched on, doing some audit. So this one, Basically, are things that you can check on a monthly basis. You can pick a sample of examinations, call it up in RIS, and you can go through and check has everything been done that was supposed to be done. So, we put 15 just because it filled up the sheet nicely, and you can do what you want. <coughs> and it's things like have you got the copy of the original request? Can you ID who the practitioner was? As Matt's been saying, 
you really need to be able to be able to identify which named person was responsible for each stage of this examination. So, can you ID the practitioner? Is there evidence of authorization? So, we've said that justification is the mental process, authorization is the documentation. Can you find that anywhere on the, on the request form or have they filled in the right box on the RIS? Things like pregnancy status and patient ID. A lot of RIS systems have patient ID and it's got drop down boxes. How did you check it? Three point check with the escort, those kind of things. So, this is a takeaway, and this is something you could do on a regular basis, monthly, or however frequently you want to do that. The other one that's going to be emailed out afterwards, because it is quite big, is this. Basically, this goes through Irma, every single piece of paper, thing that you need to do that's in the regulations is in here. So you can go through this and go, have you got that? Yes. Does it say that? Yes. So this is your checklist. Obviously, once you've done it, it will just be a case of maintenance, but this is coming out to you by email. I yes, it is. Only if you fill your feedback in. Oh, there yeah. you <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you'll have to muddle through the regulations on your own and work out what's missing and what's not. <coughs> but it's broken down into sections so that everything can research is grouped together because bits and bobs of the regulations sort of dot around, but we've grouped it all together by category. So, there you go. I remember to mention it. I've done it again. So, I've whizzed through this so that we can try and catch up some time. What does good look like? So, key points to take back to your, part, your department. You must have robust procedures in place and they must reflect local practice. We've been going on about this all day. Get your staff to read your procedures and make sure that it really does reflect what happens on the shop floor. They're written by somebody that just sits in an office and doesn't actually practice clinically. It may be that what they think is happening isn't actually happening. So get get them to check. If you've got any new members of staff, get them to give you some feedback on them because when you write these procedures, you quite often leave things out because you know how things are done in your department and a lot of procedures that we read um, have some inside <coughs> knowledge that you need to have attached to them. So get new people to read it. They're going to have to read them anyway to say that they've read them. So get some feedback from them since they have read them. Staff must follow the procedures. Again, we've talked about this. Practitioners and operators must comply with, the, with written procedures. If you don't think that the procedures in your department work, you must tell somebody. Because by not following them, you're not you're breaching the regulations. So if they don't work for you or you don't think they work for you, Tell somebody, see if you can get them changed to reflect practice. It's no good just going, I'm not going to do that. Get them changed. Encourage everyone to report near misses at actual instance. That's a bit of a no-brainer. And again, share learning from instance with all relevant staff, not just those immediately involved. Okay, I'll go. Some of the worst mistakes in my life have been my haircuts. So there's some wicked examples from me. <laughs> Not good at all. I'm blaming my parents. That's my choice anyway. <laughs> so with robust procedures in place um, that staff follow and that reflect local practice, then hopefully we'll be able to see those numbers of incidents that reported CQC drop. So, or at least we can blame the referral. But we need to do everything that we can to bring that number down and to create a safe environment for our patients. And there are email addresses, as I say, please don't all email us and the train going back. But if you do have any questions, we are here to help and we'll do what we can. Thank you.